Good morning. We're glad to have you with us today. We welcome you to the American Cancer Society Virtual HPV Vaccination Leadership Forum for the states of Ohio and West Virginia. Thank you for taking your time to be with us today. Let me introduce myself. My name is Deb Dillingham. I'm the Senior Director for Cancer Control Strategic Partnership for the American Cancer Society serving Ohio and West Virginia. We're just so happy that you've joined us. We're gonna start this morning with a poll question. You'll see it pop up on your screen, asking you to let us know where you're joining from today. We'll have a couple of polls throughout this morning's presentation and we would really appreciate your participation in those. We ask that if you've called in from a phone that you please enter your name and organization in the Q&A so we have record of your attendance. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. All lines will be muted during this program and we ask that all questions be entered into the Q&A tab on your screen. Each presenter will be answering questions after their presentation. If we don't have time to answer your question during the event, not to worry, we will follow up with the presenters and answer your question post-event. We'll give you just a moment to fill out the poll. We also wanted to let you know that the Ohio chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics has approved two hours of CME credit for this event. You'll receive a certificate for claiming your CMEs after today's event. Our objectives for today's event will be seen on the current slide in just a moment. There we go. Please note that the planning committee members and speakers have declared that there are no relative financial arrangements or affiliations with the organization that may affect balance, independency, objectivity, or scientific rigor for the CME event. Also, please know that the slides will be available after the presentation and that this event is being recorded. I now have the pleasure of introducing you to Missy Dugan. She's a sales manager, global sales at Delta Airlines, and she's a member of the ACS Ohio, West Virginia, Northern Kentucky board. Missy joined Delta Airlines after completing her degree in business management at the University of South Carolina. She's held many leadership positions at Delta Reservations before obtaining a position in global sales. In her current role, Missy is responsible for managing the relationship between Delta and top corporate accounts in the eastern half of the United States. In 2017, Missy was awarded Delta's top honor of Chairman's Club. Chairman's Club recognizes the top 1% of 1% in a given year. Missy and her husband, Tony, both grew up in Cincinnati and they reside in Liberty Township. They have three sons that are also in the Cincinnati area. Missy and Tony co-founded Project Peace, a 501c3 that assists head and neck cancer patients right here in the tri-state area as they battle cancer treatment. Missy also serves on two other boards, ACS Golf Executive Committee and the Cincinnati International Wine Festival. During her free time, Missy enjoys traveling, golfing, and volunteering in the community. I now have the pleasure of turning the program over to Missy. Thank you, Deb, and welcome. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about HPV vaccinations and the important role that ACS and it plays in HPV awareness. It's been a difficult year with COVID and I wanna thank all the medical staff and support for everything that you've done this past year. But even in the light of COVID, we need to make sure that we do not lose the progress that we've made regarding HPV awareness and vaccination status. So it's time to refocus and make sure we're not losing any ground. Why is HPV vaccination, um, why is it important? Here are the facts. HPV vaccination is cancer prevention. It prevents six types of cancer. It's for both boys and girls, and it works best when we give in between ages nine and 12 
for both boys and girls. It also provides safe, effective, and long-lasting protection. As I mentioned, I'm Missy Du, or as they mentioned, I'm Missy Dugan. Um, I'm happy to be here today. I do serve on the um, board for Ohio, um, Northern Kentucky, and West Virginia for um, American Cancer Society. I've been a volunteer for about seven plus years. You'll see on the screen my why. My husband in the background is, was diagnosed with um, throat cancer at age 47, non-smoker, non-tobacco user. So we were quite shocked when we found out the diagnosis. He was stage four and we learned that he was HPV positive which at the time was a blessing for us because we knew that the, the cancer was curable, but the treatment was rough. So he embarked on his treatment cycle of two rounds of chemo cocktails and then started his 35 rounds of radiation. He still lives with the side effects of, of his treatment, especially from radiation, but we're thankful that he is here with us. He is uh, diagnosed cancer-free in 2014. And then you'll see, um, I do have three boys. One is a little camera shy, but you'll see our, our twin sons there. They're also a reason why, because they were able, they did see everything that um, our, their dad went through during this diagnosis and treatment. So they were getting vaccinated was not an issue for us. We knew that it was important because the vaccination, as we know, can eradicate this type of cancer. Being a caregiver with someone going through head and neck cancer is very difficult. And we did start the, the 501c3, like Deb mentioned, just because we wanted to help patients as they were going through that process. And we also rely on all the resources of uh, ACS has to offer in the community and make sure that other patients connect with ACS. So we're very thankful you're here. Thank you for taking the time and we'll go over the agenda just um, to make sure that you have kind of an IV, uh, idea of what's going to happen today. So from right after this, we're going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on HP vaccinations. And the speakers for that are Dr. Paskett and Sherry Young. Then we have partner updates with our um, American Cancer CAN team in Cincinnati Children's Medical Center at 1015 to 1050, tools and resources to resume HPV vaccinations and Q&A, and 1050 to 1055, partner updates, and at 1055 to 11, next steps and wrap up and evaluation. So it'll be an engaging session today. Again, we appreciate everything you do in the community, everything you do to support our patients and everything you do to support American Cancer Society. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I have one last slide. <laughs> the most important thank you of the day. Thank you to our sponsors, Cincinnati Children's, Dayton Children's and the James. Um, these, this program is provided is supported by the Ohio Apartments for Cancer Control, Com Comprehensive Cancer Control Center. And a special thank you to Lori Sheeran Winlin, MPA, Ohio Chapter American Academy of Pediatrics, which is our CME provider. Thank you. Thank you so much, Missy. We appreciate the warm welcome to today's event. Our first speaker, as, as we just heard from Missy, is Dr. Electra Pasquet. Dr. Pasquette is a professor and director of the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control in the Department of Internal Medicine at the Ohio State University College of Medicine, where she holds the Marion and Rowley designated chair in cancer research. She also serves as the associate director for population sciences and community outreach, co-leader of the cancer control program and director of the diversity enhancement program at the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, the James. Her research program is nationally recognized for studying cancer health disparities. The program has four major areas of focus and has evolved to utilize a team of science approach to understanding and intervening in these problems. Energy balance and cancer prevention, promoting the use of early detection exams, improving access to diagnostic and treatment services, and preventing lymphedema, a chronic and potentially debilitating condition that occurs in many patients who undergo lymph node dissection as part of their cancer treatment. Through her research, she finds ways to help others prevent or reduce the burden of cancer by designing intervention strategies that persuade people to change their behavior and take control of their health. Some of her recent work has focused on intervention studies directed at cancer prevention, early detection, and survivorship issues. Um, excuse me, specifically focused on underserved populations. 
She leads several grant-funded projects and has been published extensively in prestigious scientific journals and was a past president of the American Society of Preventive Oncology, which created a scholarship in her name to honor her highly successful two-year term as leader of that multidisciplinary society. Due to scheduling conflicts, Dr. Pasquette is not able to be with us live today, but has graciously recorded a message on the state of HPV vaccination in Ohio, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on adolescent health visits, and where we can go from here to re-engage Ohio providers in HPV vaccination. I give you Dr. Pasquette. Hello, thank you for the invitation to present on HPV vaccination, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, specifically here in Ohio. What I'm going to be covering is shown here. First of all, very briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about human papillomavirus or HPV and the population health impact how the vaccine works, that it is safe and effective. However, uptake is lower than other childhood vaccines. COVID-19 has lowered vaccination rates. And then lastly, could some, spend some time on talking about some strategies that we can consider to increase the uptake of the HPV vaccine. I'd like to call your attention to the right side of the slide. This is a call to action that was issued about a month ago by the NCI designated cancer centers. It is a call for urgent action to get HPV vaccination back on track. And it was also endorsed not only by all the NCI designated cancer centers, but also by the American Cancer Society, American Association for Cancer Research, and other cancer organizations as shown on the bottom left panel of that statement. I'm going to get back to that uh, at the end, but I just want to draw your attention to the fact of the statement here that it is crucial that the nation gets back on track with adolescent vaccination to ensure protected children and safer communities. So let me briefly now go through what we know about the population health impact of the human papilloma virus. First of all, HPV is a public health problem. Four out of five people will be infected with HPV in their lifetime, and approximately 14 million people are infected each year, which includes teens. HPV affects both men and women. Mostly what we hear about is cervical cancer and cervical precancerous conditions. But there are other cancers that are impacted, oral pharyngeal cancer, anal cancer, vulvar and vaginal cancer, and penile cancer. In fact, HPV causes six specific cancers. 90% of cervical and anal cancers are linked with HPV, 60% of penile cancers, and 70% 70 70 of vaginal, vulvar, and oral pharyngeal cancers are linked with HPV. HPV has multiple impacts on population health, not just the HPV attributable cancers that I've just been talking, which average about 35,000 in the United States each year. The HPV is also responsible for about 300,000 high-grade cervical dysplasia cases, 355,000 general wart cases, over a million low-grade cervical dysplasia cases, and over 2 million abnormal pap smears for cervical cancer. This is not a small impact on the health of the population of the United States. And again, these numbers are just for the United States. The numbers across the world are uh, somewhat higher. And even an abnormal pap smear impacts women with morbidity that have long lasting consequences and can account for higher costs and other medical conditions that are not even accounted for here. 
Now let's move quickly also to the national recommendations for the HPV vaccine. The ACIP HPV recommendation, HPV vaccination recommendation is shown here. Uh, it is recommended to be given at age 11 or 12. However, vaccination can be given as early as age nine years. And I will tell you that uh, my pediatric colleagues say they have great success in offering the vaccine when the child is at age nine. For persons initiating the vaccine before their 15th birthday, the recommended immunization schedule is two doses of HPV vaccine. The second dose should be administered six to 12 months after the first dose. There is a recommendation for catch-up vaccine, vaccination for males and females aged 13 to 26, and that was approved in June of 2019. 13 and 14 year olds are under the 15 year old guideline, so they will still get a two dose series. However, starting at age 15 to age 26, it's a three dose series. For those adults age 27 to 45 who are not adequately vaccinated, the recommendation is that there be shared clinical decision making uh, conducted regarding HPV vaccination. And of course, those who decide to get vaccinated would get a three-dose series. There is some guidance on shared clinical decision-making for this age group by the CDC. I will also want to mention that um, HPV vaccination has top support and endorsement from many agencies. The next topic I want to cover is that HPV vaccination works. HPV vaccination reduces cervical precancers. You can see the yellow arrows and those are in the young age groups in 2016 compared to 2008 where we have seen dramatic decreases in high-grade cervical lesions in the United States. HPV vaccination also prevents oral HPV infections. The prevalence of oral HPV 6, 11, 16, and 18 infections was significantly reduced in vaccinated versus unvaccinated individuals in this study. HPV vaccination is most effective during adolescence, and you can see in this table that the effectiveness against um, CIN3 plus was highest when the age of vaccine was 12 to 13. It did still have an effect at 17 and a slightly lower effect uh, at over 18. And this is the most recent study from 2017 from Finland where zero cases of HPV related cancers were found among vaccinated women in Finland and this is one of the first studies we have to say that HPV vaccination prevents cancer. The other important piece to take is that HPV vaccination is safe and effective. Over 100 million doses of the vaccine have been distributed in the U.S. since it was licensed and near real-time data monitoring continues to show that the vaccine is safe and effective. And uh, you can uh, also go to uh, evidence summaries to get more detailed information if you would like. So let's now talk about the HPV vaccination rates before COVID. These are national vaccination rates, again, pre-COVID. We like to compare HPV vaccination rates to Tdap and meningococcal vaccination rates because they're recommended to be given at the same time. The Healthy People 2020 target is 80% vaccination. And you can see, number one, that we are failing, failing short, falling short of the target for HPV vaccination. And we are not even close to the rates of Tdap and meningococcal vaccine 
which demonstrates missed opportunities to vaccinate our children. Thus, we are failing to protect our children from future HPV cancers and precancers. These are some data we have, again, pre-COVID in Ohio. So in Ohio in 2017, the age-adjusted rate of new HPV-related cancer cases was 14 per 100,000 people. The 2019 adolescent human papillomavirus vaccination coverage report indicates that compared to the U.S., Ohio is lower or just about at the same rate for coverage for males for at least one dose, for males greater than three doses, which is up to date. We can call that up to date. So for males, Ohio is at about 47%. For females greater than one dose, and then females, I'll call it up to date for greater than equal to three doses, 52%. So you can see we still have a ways to go to get our children fully vaccinated and get close to that goal of 80% vaccinated. Why? Why has HPV vaccination fallen short of target levels? First of all, misinformation, negative beliefs, and attitudes. And that is across the board. Uh, we find this not only in parents, but the general community, community members, as well as some providers. Lack of strong recommendation from healthcare providers. That is really the number one reason that parents will get their child vaccinated is if they receive a strong recommendation from healthcare providers. And many of our providers aren't comfortable with providing a strong recommendation. And thirdly, fear of side effects and overall safety. And I've just provided you good information on the safety of the HPV vaccine. And that is something that needs to be discussed with parents. Now let's see how uh, HPV vaccination rates were impacted by the COVID pandemic. Well, what do we know? First of all, we don't have any rates yet for 2020. I believe sometime this year we will get those rates. But we can use a proxy. And the proxy we can use is wellness visits because that's most likely where vaccinations are given, again, to this age group, these, these children, 11 to 12 year olds. If we look at wellness visits, all age groups from infants to adults have seen a decrease in visits during the pandemic. And the decrease started, of course, in March of 2020. The adolescent cohorts, and these are two cohorts, the cohorts age 11 to 12 and age 13 to 17, certainly within the guidelines I've just told you for HPV vaccination, had the most severe drop of any age group. At the lowest point, there was recorded a 50 to 60% decrease in wellness visits in these two age groups from the preceding year, 2019. By February, 2021, there was still a 36% decrease in the 11 and 12 year olds and a 31% decrease in the 13 and 17 year olds from wellness visits same time in 2019. So what experts have estimated is that there were 9 million dose of, doses of adolescent vaccines that were missed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And currently, there is quite a concern about catch up for those adolescents as well as getting this year's teens in who are due for vaccines. So lastly, what are some strategies that we can consider to get back on track to catch up and to get those due this year for their HPV vaccine? First of all, we can consider, consider opportunistic vaccination. That means when children and adolescents are coming in for other type of visits, the physicians and the healthcare team can recommend that they get caught up on their vaccinations, including HPV vaccine. 
A second suggestion is that providers should communicate appointment availability as safety measures that they have in place in their offices. Many people believe, and, and I've actually had this question asked to me twice in one week, are there any appointments available now for things like screening and vaccination? So providers, when they communicate availability, they should address any myths or preconceived notions that people have that it will take months to get in to get your child vaccinated. And of course, address concerns about COVID-19 spread by coming to the medical facility. That still is a real concern in the community. Next strategy is to remind those who need vaccines to come in. If people aren't coming in for opportunistic reasons, then send reminders, either letters, uh, text messages, or if they use my chart, remind them to come in for vaccines. And also, it is okay to bundle adolescent vaccines with COVID-19 vaccine for those who are 12 uh, to 15 or, or even older. Another strategy is to use media campaigns. I believe we have seen some of those media campaigns on the television now, but I think that's very important. And the media message from the media campaigns can address the myths and concerns I talked about, as well as reminding people that they need to come in for wellness visits and to get the, their children vaccinated. We can also consider alternative strategies for vaccination. For example, curbside clinics or drive through clinics, vaccinating at health fairs, and using mobiles to take care and vaccines out into the communities. And these, these have been considered and actually have been done around the country for COVID uh, testing and now vaccination and can also now be done for wellness visits, for screening, as well as for vaccination. And the last strategy I've listed here is to consider a statewide awareness campaign. And in the Ohio Partners for Cancer Control, which is the state cancer control program, we are considering a statewide awareness campaign to not only get back on track for HPV vaccination, but also for cancer screenings, which, as you all know, have also decreased in the last year. So I'd like to get back to the call for urgent action and remind everybody it is our responsibility and it is crucial to protect our adolescents from cancers caused by HPV. And it is important important and urgent to act now to get HPV vaccination back on track. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pascat. We are so grateful for your comments. Even though she was not available to be with us live, she took the time to put all of that fantastic information together. So Dr. Pascat, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Our next speaker, unlike the slide, is actually, is actually Dr. Sherry Young. Dr. Young uh, started as a health officer and executive director at the Kanawha Charleston Health Department on July 1, 2019. She is the first woman and the first doctor of osteopathic medicine to be the county's full-time health officer. Originally of Mullins, Young earned her Bachelor of Science in Speech Pathology and Audiology at West Virginia University and her Doctorate of Osteopathic Medicine from the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine. She trained in family medicine at Charleston Area Medical Center after earning her doctorate. As the state's immunization officer from September 2015 to January 2015, Young reviewed and made medical vaccine exemptions for the state's school-age children and spoke about immunizations and medical exemptions at the state and national level. Prior to serving as immunization officer, Young served as the physician director of the state's Division of Immunization Services and medical director of the Division of STD, HIV, and Hepatitis from September 2015 through July of 2016. Dr. Young has been a Kanawha County resident for 16 years. She lives in Pinch with her daughter and her husband. 
Dr. Young is the current president of the West Virginia Academy of Family Physicians and the immediate past president of the Kanawha County Medical Association. We're so grateful for you to take the time this morning with us, Dr. Young, and we appreciate your contribution. I turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be here today. Um, again, uh, th this is such an important discussion. As you hear, my background is in immunizations. And so this is a cause that is near and dear to my heart. Um, unfortunately, we have been called away as health officers across the country. We've been called away to um, address COVID issues for months now. In fact, our health command structure will talk about that, but uh, we are 470 plus days into the fight. And so while HPV vaccination has gone to the wayside, unfortunately, a lot of other medical issues have um, as well. So um, what, what I'd like to get into is where we are with HPV vaccinations, where we'd like to be. And I do think it's, it's going to um, resonate what, what our goals are to get to that 80% and the, what it is going to take to get us to that 80% vaccination rate. Because what we're talking about here with HPV vaccination specifically is cancer prevention. If we had the means to have other cancer preventions through the means of an immunization, there would be not much discussed, not much discussion. Uh, so therefore, we need a very robust discussion around the HPV vaccinations and education uh, and support to get this into our communities. All right, so the, we are sitting in Kanawha County, and uh, today, as I said, it's day 479 of our health command structure. Um, what we have is uh, a total of 15,639 cases that over the past uh, year and a half we've been tracking. Currently, right now, we're down to 91 active cases. Uh, we had much fewer than that when we went into our shutdown last year. Uh, 91 is a treat at the height of the pandemic, we had over 2,000 cases at one time trying to manage um, our 180,000 citizens here in Kanawha County uh, and keeping them safe. Uh, thankfully, we've had 15,230 people recover, uh, but unfortunately, we've also had 318 individuals die from COVID um, in, in this battle. And so that's the number of people who have died directly from COVID or related to COVID. Our actual toll, we may never know because during our shutdown, while we have been socially isolated, while offices had to be closed, while people had to stay apart, we missed out on our wellness screenings, both children and adults, cancer screenings, immunizations, mental health visits. And so the toll that COVID has taken on us is immeasurable. Um, there was work to do with the HPV vaccine far before COVID hit, but this is another factor that we have got to dig in our heels, educate the public, get rid of that misinformation, get rid of that lack of strong uh, recommendation from the physician community and the healthcare community, and get rid of the fear of the side effects of this, because this is cancer prevention and very important, um, along with all of the other uh, wellness and other issues that we need to address. Going, going back one slide, of course, these are the things that we're preventing with our vac uh, vaccinations. Of course, we're preventing cervical cancers in women, vulvar and vaginal cancers in women, anal cancers in both men and women, and certain head and neck cancers, such as throat cancers and mouth cancers in both men and women, and genital warts as well. Uh, while this is a cancer prevention, this is not just a multitude of uh, cervical cancers. Well, that is a, a very important. This is a preventable disease with the uh, use of our vaccinations. The, um, the prevention rate is extremely high if the vaccine is given. And so the education out there, when we first had our HPV vaccines, if you remember, there was Cervarex and it was indicated only for women. So there are some providers out there still feeling like this is a cervical cancer prevention. We need to educate our providers. We need to educate the public that this is far more than just a cervical cancer prevention. This is multiple types of cancer prevention and that this is for men and women. This is not something that is for women alone. Just a review, I think we need to talk about if we're talking about HPV, how does HPV get spread and how does it uh, affect us in our bodies? So 
After exposure, we have about 80% of adults who are sexually active who are exposed to HPV. And so as the HPV uh, virus takes hold in those infected basal cells, uh, they, they do replicate with about 90% of people uh, healing within two years. Now that can contribute to some abnormal pap smears and other things, but in most part, we do see people that recover from it. Yet we still see a preventable cancer by giving a vaccination so that that 0.8% doesn't turn into the thousands of women that will die of, of cervical cancer each year. And so just having that visual of how the, the virus is replicated and how it hides in the body and how this isn't something that's gonna be an immediate cancer necessarily, that it's something that could affect people far into their adulthood and far past the point that they think that they're vulnerable from this. This is why we need to talk about the vaccine and getting it in at an age appropriate time. Just by preventing HPV 16 and 18, we're preventing 70% of cervical cancers. Yet now we have the vaccine that is nine valent. We have the ability to prevent not only cervical cancers, but also additional cancers. Moving forward, as we said, Gardasil, we have Gardasil 9 now, and that is a nine valent vaccine that we have. Um, it sounds like lottery numbers in a way, but 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. And that's, that does, while it is only a portion of the HPV, vac HPV viruses that we see, it, are, it is the key elements to prevention of vulvar, vaginal, uh, head and neck cancers, as well as cervical cancers. Just provide you with some of the numbers that we've had over the last several years. Uh, the, the data that I had, I could not mine the data exactly from the state of West Virginia to share with you, although we rank about average uh, with our HPV vaccines. Uh, the last data that I was able to mine was prior to 2019, and we were sitting at about 42%, just around the national average as far as the um, uh, immunizations for HPV, but I can share with you the numbers, the hard numbers that we do have out of the health department here and the impact that has been made. So in a typical year, we have uh, more than 100 females and males coming in for their uh, HPV vaccines. Once COVID hit, we are less at 60 and 31, 54 and 18. This is far below. This, this is a um, reduction of more than 50% in cancer prevention. So we need to take a look at how we can get this out, reframing our messaging and making it part of these childhood vaccinations. I can tell you from looking through the numbers, not only are we lacking right now in HPV vaccinations, but we are lacking in all childhood immunizations. We've seen more than a 50% decrease since the inception of COVID. And that's because people weren't coming out, people weren't getting wellness care and a lot of the resources also being diverted. Um, one of the ways that we're addressing this at the Kanawha Charles Charleston Health Department, prior to the start of school year, um, we have every Wednesday dedicated solely to childhood immunizations. And so in West Virginia, we have very good immunization laws for compulsory immunizations. They've been around since 1981, and they've been strengthened over and over again. Now, again, they get, get challenged. Um, but in West Virginia, we have very strong immunization laws for school attendance, which means that you have to have a medical exemption. We do not accept, uh, we do not accept philosophical or other religious exemptions. You have to have a medical exemption not to receive one of the compulsory immunizations to go to school. Unfortunately, HPV is not one of those compulsory immunizations, but the opportunity when we update our Tdap, when we update our meningococcal at our 11 and 12 year old visits, that's when we need to be making these uh, recommendations, educating parents, educating kids, and getting these vaccination rates back up. It's one of our only opportunities. We have to make this right. Next slide. So the HPV uh, vaccine indications, of course, they, you can start at age nine. Um, the ACIP recommendations are for those 11 to 12 years old. The vaccine is indicated to those uh, 26 uh, years of age. And uh, as it was being studied, the reason the 26 uh, uh, was being, that was the number that, that the age that was studied. 
Um, we do know that those under the age of 15, they have a better immune response. And so in fact, with that, uh, you get two shots instead of, instead of three for that completion. For that, vaccination is not recommended for everyone older than age 26. However, they did come back and make the recommendation that for those at risk or who decide to get the HPV vaccine who had missed the opportunity between the ages of 27 and 45, they can get the vaccine and they will have to do the three-part series. But it does acknowledge the fact that maybe in this age group, this vaccine was not available. Maybe they had Cervix and they didn't have the full coverage. One of the things that it mentions too is that if you're in a monogamous relationship that you may not be at risk. And one thing that I counsel my patients with is that while you may be in a monogamous relationship, your partner or, or others may not be. And so the better protection for yourself and for uh, the ones you love, get that vaccine if you have the opportunity. For those uh, age 27 to 45, again, you, it's a clinical basis. We really need to be focusing on our um, adolescents, getting that information out as far as the misinformation, the lack of strong recommendations um, that we see from healthcare providers, the hesitancy that they have, and then the fear from the side effects. Those may be reasons we are missing those opportunities, but we need to have these conversations with our 27 to 45 year olds as well, because if we can still prevent cancer, we may not be catching them at the opportune time, but we don't wanna miss the opportunity later on as well. So keep in mind the HPV vaccine is uh, a preventative. Um, it is preventative. It does not treat HPV infect infection or active disease. It does not treat cancer. Uh, that is something that we need to be aware of, but it is best to get that vaccine before exposure to HPV. And that's one of the difficult conversations that you may have as healthcare providers with parents because it is associated with sexual activity. We know that that is one of the means. It is skin to skin contact, we know that. The framing of that message needs to be, we are preventing cancer far down the road. You don't put on your seatbelt after you have an accident. You put the seatbelt on to be safe. It does not give you permission to be in an accident. What we are doing here is we are giving kids the ability to prevent cancer far down the road and try to get that vaccine in before they become at risk. Because we know the most sexually active adults have already been exposed and that's up to 80% of, of those uh, individuals. So there are two doses of HPV vaccine recommended for persons starting the series before their 15th birthday. I think that is an excellent selling point if you're uh, talking to the, uh, the adolescents and just like we talked about with COVID vaccines or other vaccines with various, um, with various uh, marketing out there, two shots are always gonna be preferred over three shots. And, and so that, that can be a benefit um, for, for those individuals. If you are given the two shot dose, it is going to be on the date that it's first given. And then you get the second dose between six to 12 months after that first dose. For adolescents who receive the two doses less than five months apart, then they have not waited that allotted period and they should uh, be given a third dose of HPV vaccine, unfortunately. For the three dose series of the HPV vaccine recommended for tens and young, uh, ten, teens and young adults, we start the series after the age of uh, 15 uh, or for those who are immunocompromised. For those individuals who have immunocompromised because of medication or a medical condition, we want them to have the maximum benefits and protection from uh, HPV. So we do recommend that those individuals um, receive the three dose series. And that would be on the first date, the second or the first date of uh, administration, the uh, one to two months, and then a six months. Three doses are recommended for those uh, immunocompromised, such as HIV infections, cancers, medications that would uh, hamper the immune system for any of those age 20 uh, from 26 uh, on down to age nine. So some of the contraindications and precautions that we need to be aware of. There is a lot of misinformation out on the internet. And one of the scariest things I think as parents is that we see uh, one of the arguments being that it can um, cause infertility later on. And that is certainly not the case. Here's what we do need to be careful with. 
uh, severe allergic reaction to a vaccine or vaccine component, if they've had uh, a previous reaction, especially an anaphylactic type reaction, we do not want to give that additional dose. If they have an anaphylactic allergy to latex, uh, that's a contraindication to the bivalent HPV vaccine because the pre-filled syringes um, have a, a, a rubber latex tip. So there's still the availability to get the vaccine, it just cannot be the pre-filled syringes. For the quadrivalent nine and nine-valent HPV vaccine, um, if there is there is Baker's yeast that is used to um, manufacture a part of that. So if you have a severe allergy um, to yeast, then that is something that you may have a hypersensitivity to uh, the vaccine because of the way that it is um, manufactured. For a moderate to severe illness, um, for a moderate to severe illness, the precaution of the vaccination ends. Um, should be deferred until symptoms are improved. And of course, minor acute illness, diarrhea, upper uh, respiratory tract infection with or without fever, those are not reasons to defer the vaccinations. Next slide. And then of course, some precautions. We do not wanna give the vaccine during pregnancy. It has not been studied and is not recommended during pregnancy. However, if you would happen to give the first dose during pregnancy, you would wait until such time that uh, you would wait until such time that they would no longer be pregnant uh, to finish those doses. Don't be alarmed. You should contact the manufacturer and notify the uh, patient, and um, uh, if, if they would become pregnant, and uh, just keep that keep that in your in mind that you wouldn't finish that series and that they will be fine. Uh, but they will no longer continue that series until uh, the end of that pregnancy. All right, so common adverse reactions that we see. Um, for the most, mo most common adverse reactions that we see reported during clinical trials of HPV, they're local site reactions. That is something that we typically see with, um, with many of the vaccines that we've been giving. And that is, um, that, that is something that we see um, commonly with any vaccine. That is not something that's unique uh, to uh, the HPV vaccine. So we do see that um, a little arm soreness, a little redness, um, typically tell people that they can take some Tylenol, have a cold compress, and that usually those are limited to one to two days. Uh, in the pre-licensure clinical trials, the local reactions such as pain, redness, swelling, uh, were, were reported anywhere from 20 to 90% of the recipients. So it's a very variable number. A low grade fever during the uh, 15 days after the vaccination was reported in about 10 to 11% uh, of the HPV recipients. And um, a, a similar proportion was reported also in the uh, placebo. So it may or may not be related to that, but if you, the cautionary uh, piece for the patients is if they have a fever, take some Tylenol, some Motrin, stay well hydrated, and report anything over 100 uh, back to their primary care provider. A variety of symptoms and adverse reactions have been reported by the vaccine recipients, including nausea, dizziness, myalgias, and malaise. However, these symptoms occurred with equal frequency both among the HPV vaccines as well as the placebo. So local reactions generally increase in frequency with increasing doses. Um, so you're more likely to have arm soreness or redness um, after the second or third shot, uh, that's pretty typical as far as any series of vaccines is concerned and not unique to the HPV vaccine. And then no serious adverse events have been associated with any HPV vaccine, but ongoing uh, monitoring and studying is being conducted by the CDC um, as we uh, distribute those vaccines. Same way that we are looking at all vaccines, even with the COVID vaccine rollout. So we are monitoring these side effects and this is what we need to share with our patients. This is what we need to share with our healthcare providers, that it is a very low profile as far as what our uh, risks are and compared to um, the possibility of cancer or other comorbidities, that this is absolutely minor in comparison to what the consequences of not vaccinating would be. With that, we can advance to the last slide. This is my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me regarding any questions that you may have. Um, again, I'm uh, here at the Kanawha Charleston Health Department. I'm thank you for including me in the discussion today and anything we can do to help with any type of vaccination and especially the pre uh, prevention of cancer and the promotion of HPV vaccination. We're certainly happy to do that.
Thank you so much, Dr. Young. We have we really enjoyed your conversation this morning. We appreciate it. I hope you have a moment for just a couple of questions. I think we have a few in the chat box. Would that work for you? Absolutely, ready for questions. All right, sounds good. Uh, let me ask our producer if we wanted to use the questions that I'm looking at, or do we have others that you wanted to bring forward from the Q&A box? I think those are good, Deb. All right, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, Dr. Young, first question. Is the decreased efficacy of HPV vaccine with age due to likeliness of being exposed to HPV already or due to decreased immune response to vaccine? And that's an excellent question. Actually, it is due to the decreased immune response. And uh, what we see is that in our 11 and 12 year olds and up to 15 years of age, their immune systems are nice and fresh and they um, they're very good at forming an immune response. And so we see that younger patients, not only for the HPV vaccine, but for our childhood vaccines, they have a very good re immune response. So it does have to do with age and the ability to form that immune, uh, immune response. Uh, even though people can be exposed to HPV at an older, at a greater age, um, the ability to form those antibodies does tend to wane a little over time. Great. Thanks, Dr. Young. Uh, next question. If the, oh, jumped around. If the vaccine was given at 17 and now the patient is 21, do they have to start with a three-shot series all over again? I'm thinking what the question would be that if somebody is age 17, they maybe have received the quadrivalent, which is the four-valent vaccine. Um, now we have the nine-valent vaccine available that covers more strains of, the, um, of HPV. That is a clinical decision. The CDC doesn't have any recommended guidance and there's um, nothing through the ACIP that says you have to start that series over again. But I think that's a good conversation to have with them. There's no wrong answer for restarting it. It's not a wrong answer to add additional cancer prevention and it's not going to hurt in any way um, to e even though some of those components would have been in the first vaccine, uh, you, you are not gonna do any damage to the immune system or to the person themselves. Um, personally, from my point of view, um, if, if you have already offered that protection with that quadrivalent vaccine and you have a better vaccine on their horizon and they're now 21 to discuss that with them, that is still that critical age group where you have the ability to prevent multiple types of cancer. So my recommendation as a healthcare provider, have that um, conversation with that patient and it would, be, um, it would be a good idea to go ahead and repeat that series. Would it be mandatory? No. But would they have additional protection? Yes. And that's never the wrong answer. Got it. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Young. We appreciate it. The next question coming in is, could you please talk about the co-vaccination with the COVID vaccine? Yes. Early in the uh, inception of the COVID vaccine, when we had Pfizer, Moderna, and then the Johnson & Johnson coming to market, each of those... Um, it, if we've had our COVID vaccines, that one of the things they ask you um, is, have you had another vaccine within the last 14 days? And so it was a uh, precaution because we didn't know how the new mRNA vaccines were going to react. We did not know, um, we did not want anything in the immune system to be competing or fighting for the maximum benefit of that COVID vaccine. We have enough data now having done millions of vaccines at this point, that there's no indication that a person cannot form the antibodies for the COVID vaccine as well as another vaccine. So that's no longer a, a contraindication. So if you've had that vaccine within the four, 14 days or you want to co-administer, as long as you are moving at least an inch uh, apart in the deltoid muscle or use alternating arms, you can absolutely receive both vaccines. In fact, that would be a wonderful thing to do because we still need people vaccinated for COVID, but we also need cancer prevention as well. That's terrific, terrific. Thank you, Dr. Young. Um, a question has come in from our audience. Parents often decline HPV vaccine because their child is not sexually active or appear to be offended that I would assume their child could be capable of having sex. What would you say to this parent? That is a difficult conversation to have. And so as a healthcare provider, it's better to reframe that message. And so as you're talking about Tdap, tell, tell them, people don't always ask questions. You say that it's time for a Tdap vaccine uh, for at the 11 and 12 year old visit. It's time for your meningococcal vaccine. They don't have a lot of questions, but give them the information. This is why we're doing Tdap. 
this is why we're doing meningococcal and what we're preventing. But add that in there. It's time for your HPV vaccine. This is cancer prevention. If it leads to a discussion about my child's not sexually active, you use my analogy, and I'm happy to share that. And, and I have learned it from somebody else at the American Cancer Society from years ago. Um, but just because you you put a seatbelt on, you tell a kid to put a seatbelt on in a car, it doesn't give them permission to be in an accident, um, but it does provide protection. And so having that conversation, if they say that, no, their, their child's not sexually active, then share with them, good, that is the perfect time to give this vaccine because it will prevent them from the 80% chance that they're going to get an exposure to HPV just by being sexually active. And I always give the caveat too, you can have a perfect child. What happens when, when they get married? What happens even if they're a perfect child who we can't control everything outside of our, um, outside of what our children do. We can't control who they fall in love with, who or, or what that situation is going to be. The best thing that you can do is give them the tools to be safe in the future. So reframing the, the message that Yes, I acknowledge your child is not sexually active. That is why this is the perfect time to give this vaccine is because we're going to prevent cancer. And when you reframe it in that message and acknowledging their concerns that yes, this is not because they're sexually active. This is because we are preventing cancer. That reframes it and addresses that concern. Very much appreciate that. Thank you so much. Could you comment on administering HPV in school-based settings so should we obtain separate parental consent for this vaccine or use enrollment in the program as consent for this vaccine? Well, it's an interesting, it depends on what state you're in and how that looks mm -hmm. uh, because you have emancipation for minors for treatment of um, STDs, HIV, et cetera. Um, and you have the means for pregnancy prevention due to sexual activity. If you look at the HPV vaccine, it is a means of prevention. And so far, while it is not a treatment, if you read the rules correctly, you could, in theory, give, but I would be careful looking at the state law before challenging anybody's medical license, but if they want that vaccine for because of sexual activity as a means of prevention, the same that you would prevent pregnancy, yes, under those rules, you should be able to give it. Great, great. Thank you, Dr. Young, we appreciate it. Uh, could you comment on the cost of the vaccine and insurance coverage for adults? Okay, that is an excellent question. As far as the insurance coverage for adults, um, when they did expand the coverage to age 40, 26 to 45, um, we did see some hesitation, um, but I think that has gotten a little better. One thing that, that ends up, um, policies are written for insurance agencies all of the time. They're, they're underwritten. And those policies are set to be there for about a year, and then they're reevaluated. Sometimes it just doesn't catch up to the new policies with new recommendations, but we are seeing an, a better uptake as far as cancer prevention. One of the things you can use to your advantage as far as the insurance payers is they have something called HEDIS measures. HEDIS measures are their quality metrics to say that they are approving the appropriate things and that they are doing enough for things like cancer prevention. So if you would end up on a peer-to-peer, -peer, I'm not telling you how to do this, but if you would have a denial from an insurance agency, one of the best arguments you can make is that this is cancer prevention and that it would affect their HEDIS measures. And so if you would, not that you would, if you would have any pushback or denial of, of services, that is the argument that you make, that this is a preventive service and you shouldn't have any trouble after that. Incredibly compelling. Dr. Young, thank you so much. We are so grateful for your conversation with us this morning and for you taking the time to answer these questions and give them such great thought, thoughtful answers. So thank you, Dr. Young. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, everyone. Pleasure having you with us. Now we, um, we have a next speaker with us and that is Lauren Codem. And Lauren Codem is the Director of Grassroots Organizing with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. And Lauren is here to share with us this morning some updates on our government relations team. All right. Thanks, Deb. Um, so as Deb mentioned, I work for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Um, I'll refer to it from here on out as ACSCAN. Um, next slide, Ashley. So 
For 20 years, the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, I already lied, ACS CAN has made cancer a top priority for policymakers at every level of government and has had measurable impact in reducing cancer's toll on individuals and families nationwide. ACS CAN empowers volunteers across the country to make their voices heard to influence evidence-based public policy changes that saves lives. So we believe everyone should have a fair and just opportunity to prevent, find, treat, and survive cancer. And we mark our, our, mark our 20th anniversary this year. Um, we're more determined than ever to stand together with our volunteers and save more lives from cancer. So you can see up here on our current slide um, is our group of ACS CAN volunteers. There are Ohio volunteers, and this just happened to be during our last trip in Washington, DC back in 2019, where we were um, up on the Hill advocating on behalf of cancer patients with our elected officials. And on the next few slides, I'm gonna highlight some of our achievements over the last 20 years. Um, I think that you know, are, are, should be of interest to you um, and help explain our organization. So first, ACS CAN advocates for everyone's right to breathe smoke-free air so that no one is forced to choose between the health, uh, their health and a paycheck. Uh, since 2001, we've influenced the passage of laws that require 100% smoke-free workplaces, including restaurants and bars. 27 states, including um, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, the District of Columbia, and more than 1,131 municipalities across the country. So back in 2006, um, several of my our, um, Ohio, um, I'm sorry, several of my Ohio volunteers um, will tell you that passing Ohio's indoor air law was one of their favorite memories um, of their advocacy work for ACS CAN over these last 20 years. And Ohio passed the work um, Smoke-Free Workplace Act and it was implemented back in 2006 um, and required places of employment in public places to be smoke free. So up on the slide here, you'll see a number of the staff from ACS um, celebrating the 10 year anniversary of that legislation back in 2016, which I can't believe it's so long ago now. <laughs> um, but truly, we, you know, we've accomplished so much over the last 20 years. Um, next slide. With our grassroots volunteers telling their stories with lawmakers, um, as well as through our direct lobbying efforts with our staff in Washington, DC. Um, so just to give you some quick highlights and some of the timeline of our, um, of our wins and successes over the past um, 20 years. In 2003, we were able to double the funding to the National Institute of Health. It was part of a five-year effort to, um, to get that funding increase. In 2005, our grassroots volunteers um, really helped push the patient navigation legislation that was enacted to expand access to cancer prevention and early detection and treat um, and the treatment to reduce cancer disparities. And then in 2006, one of our signature campaigns, and I think in the office in Cleveland, um, we still have red bras um, on, on, on print material um, where we were able to protect coverage for mammograms and cancer screenings. And that campaign was, um, you know, super important to the organization, but we had over 100,000 people take um, action as part of that campaign. And we were able to recruit over 80,000 new grassroots volunteers to advocate with us. Um, up on the screen, I see a picture of some of the outreach we do in the community regarding breast cancer. Um, in 2007, our volunteers were able to help um, secure the reauthorization at a higher level for the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program. Um, this is something we also advocate for here in the state of Ohio. We call it the Breast and Cervical Cancer Project in Ohio. It's, it's sometimes called something different in a lot of other states across the country. But in Ohio, we've served over 100,000 women um, since 1994 with this project. And it's detected nearly 6,000 cases of breast and cervical cancers. The program receives funding from both the CDC um, and the state. It requires a one to three state funding match. So this is one of those important funding um, and access to care issues our volunteers engage with our lawmakers um, during each of Ohio's budget cycle. Um, over the years, we've been able to help expand the eligibility for Ohio's BSAP program, as well as increase funding for this project. Um, and just this year, 
our volunteers back in May during our Cancer Action Day um, met with um, many of Ohio lawmakers. I, I don't have the dirt, an ex exact number in front of me. Um, and once again, advocating for um, ma maintaining the current funding level for this project, if not to increase it. So next slide. One of my um, favorite campaigns and um, the, the images up on the screen as well was our um, when we kicked off our, in 2015, um, a partnership with Stand Up to Cancer, um, when we launched our One Degree campaign. Um, and it was designed to help us increase the funding for the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute. You know, the messaging for this campaign was really personal because, you know, we, we really are all one degree from somebody with cancer. And it not only allowed our volunteers to really um, connect emotionally to the, the research increase, but allowed our lawmakers to really share their one degree from cancer as well, um, which many did. And it, it just kind of helped um, show the importance for increased cancer research. Uh, next slide. So in my time with ACS CAN, um, I've watched volunteers share their personal stories with lawmakers and their communities to help share the importance of access to care, um, you know, help us expand Medicaid in Ohio, prevent cancer through um, programs like Ohio's Breast and Cervical Cancer Project, and save um, cancer patients and families um, from having to go bankrupt due to the cost of um, medications. And up on the slide, you um, you see one of our volunteers, Jolie Ditch. Um, is, is over the shoulder of Governor Kasich at the time. Her story really made a um, significant impact in helping pass Ohio's oral chemotherapy therapy parity um, bill several years ago. Um, and, um, you know, it's through the, the power of our volunteers and their stories and their voices, meeting with lawmakers that really makes a difference in the work that we do. You know, just this past week, we've had our volunteers calling members of the House Health Committee sharing um, their, our opposition to House Bill 248. Um, it's a bill that's bad for public health, um, and it's especially threatening to cancer patients amidst the COVID-19 has given, um, in it, you know, in, in this topic today, it really, um, with, with HPV, um, that it's just, it's, it's, it's a bad bill. Um, HPV, or I'm sorry, House Bill 248's efforts to prevent hospitals, schools, and places of business from requiring vaccinations, where current Ohio laws um, allow parents to decline vaccinations for their children for reasons of conscience. conscience. Um, this bill would um, kind of take that that um, that away. It, it, they would be there would be no requirement um, for HPV vaccines, or not that there is right now. There's no mandate in Ohio, but for um, measles, mumps, rubella, um, and including things like the COVID-19 vaccine. We're also concerned that the policy change in House Bill 248 would increase the ease in which an exemption from school requirements can be attained and eliminate the tracking disclosure mechanisms that um, ensure vaccine requirements are enforced. So we have, um, we've offered our own written testimony um, in opposition of this bill, but our volunteers were also incredibly active this past week. Um, and will continue to be active um, in the opposition of this bill. Other volunteers called their representatives to ask the, um, that House Bill 135, a bill to reform the discrimination, discriminating policies of co-pay accumulators be scheduled for a floor vote because many cancer patients and survivors rely on co-pay assistance programs to help them afford their drugs. So co-pay assistance should count towards the deductible and that's the message our volunteers have been messaging with their own lawmakers. Um, you know, I, I think the underlining message I just want to share, especially with sharing some of the, the wins we've had over the past 20 years, is that the, our organizations and our volunteers are really a voice for cancer patients with lawmakers. And I, you know, truly invite you to join us to be part of our next 20 years to help us make a difference in the fight against cancer. Um, next slide. It's just our, uh, our website. So if you, uh, if, if, if you wanna learn more about the work that we're doing here in Ohio, you can certainly visit fightcancer.org slash Ohio. And um, you know, lots of the testimony that we've offered over the past year is up on our website as well as um, press releases and the activities our volunteers are engaging in. Um, and I, I hope that you would consider to join us in, uh, in our work at the State House and in Washington DC to make a difference for cancer patients. So thank you. Lauren, thank you so much. We do appreciate it. It looks like we have one question. Do you have time to answer a question that has come in? I will try. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
A positive di a patient diagnosed with HPV positive tonsil cancer was denied proton beam radiation ordered by the oncologist. Are we close to any bills regarding this program? You know, I'll have to double check with our government relations director. I know we monitor a lot of access to care bills at the state house. Um, I'm not, I, I don't have a list in front of me to, um, to, to, to answer that right now, but I can find an answer for you and, and get back to you on that. Sounds good, Lauren. Thank you so much. We do appreciate it. Let me ask our producer, do we see any other questions that have come in in the Q&A? We don't, Deb. We're good to go. All right, fair enough. Thank you so much. Lauren, thank you for spending time with us this morning. Thank you for this important update. We are so appreciative of the work that our sister organization, the Cancer Action Network, is taking on, and we're here to support. So thank you. We appreciate your time with us today. Our next speaker comes to us from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Uh, please welcome Deb Kent. Deb is a doctor of nursing practice and population health leadership at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center on cancer survivorship. She is the coordinator for the Cancer and Blood Disease Institute's Cancer Survivor Program, where she provides evidence-based care for over 2,000 survivors, outcomes management work, quality improvement, and survivorship research at the institutional and national level. So we are so thrilled to have you with us, Deb. Thank you so much, and I turn the program over to you. Hello, my name is Deborah Kent. I'm a nurse practitioner in survivorship at Cincinnati Children's. I'm delighted today to pre present to you HPV best practices in the Cancer and Blood Disease Institute. Our work is sponsored by a Cincinnati Children's Patient Services Research Grant and our CBDI leadership team. We at Cincinnati Children's are in the business of curing cancer in kids. And in fact, we do this very well. However, we recognize that we have the opportunity to prevent cancer in our population. We know every year in the United States, 27,000 people get cancer that's caused by or linked to HPV in some capacity. That's one person every 20 minutes of every day, all year long. And that data to me is quite astounding. We know we then have an opportunity to prevent future cancers in the kids that we take care of. And we're working really hard to do that. I'm gonna share that data with you. However, we also recognize, as you can see from the top part of this picture, that we have another opportunity to advocate for prevention of HPV related outcomes by advocating for cancer related screenings in our population as they age. So let's look at the background surrounding our HPV work. Even though the HPV immunization has established efficacy and safety, we know that uptake of the HPV vaccine in the US population has been much lower than other adolescent immunizations. This lower uptake is a particular problem, especially for our pediatric adolescent and young adult cancer survivor population because we understand from the literature that our population has the potential to be at increased risk for secondary cancers. Preliminary Cancer Institute data suggested to us that our oncology population was in fact under immunized. So we had a challenge on our hands. Our challenge was to in fact figure out how we could increase uptake of the HPV vaccination in our childhood cancer survivor population. So let's look at some of the background surrounding this. Pediatric cancer patients, when they come to us and are diagnosed, we put them on therapy and cease immunizations during that therapy. Number one, they're immunocompromised and we don't know if they're gonna actually mount a response to a vaccine when they're immunocompromised. And number two, uh, some of our vaccines are in fact live viruses and we do not wanna give a live virus to an immunocompromised host. So we re-immunize the population when they're six months to one year off therapy uh, in a diagnosis dependent fashion. What we were finding anecdotally was that our HPV vaccination was frequently omitted or essentially saved for last. There was a lack of standardized and strong messaging and quite frankly, comfort level in talking about HPV immunization. 
Very often we referred back to the primary care provider versus seizing the opportunity to immunize a patient while they were in our oncology clinic. So we sought to improve our messaging and created an HPV video. We worked under the leadership of Dr. John Parentesis with the DAP program at the University of Cincinnati to develop a strong evidence-based video of survivor messaging surrounding HPV. Then as part of my doctoral work, I looked at the ease of use in a busy pediatric oncology clinic. We then asked parents and patients to provide us with information about the rationale for uptake or non-uptake of immunization. Here are some of the information that parents and survivors shared with us. When we asked them, did the video give them new information about HPV immunization? We can see from this chart with survivors depicted in red and parents slash caregivers uh, presented in blue that 85% of survivors and 73% of patients either agreed or strongly agreed that our video gave them new information about HPV. We also asked them to rate their satisfaction with receiving the HPV information in a video format. And similarly, 90% of survivors and 86% of parents or caregivers were either satisfied or very satisfied with receiving information in a video format. So with this background information and data in mind, I sought the patient services research grant and was awarded this opportunity. There are four aims to our project. The first aim is to report population level HPV initiation and completion rates for children treated for pediatric malignancy in the Cancer Institute via medical record documentation of immunization in terms of an administration date or other objective source documentation such as a parent provided immunization record. This was a novel aim at the time of the grant submission because prior work in the cancer survivor population had looked at patient and parent self-reported uh, immunization uh, uptake versus actual immunization record documentation. Our second aim was to compare vaccination initiation and completion in the pediatric and adolescent cancer survivors to rates in the general US population in Ohio, and to look at whether the initiation of our HPV video improved those rates. Our third aim was to, to develop, excuse me, to identify predictors of HPV vaccine non-initiation or non-completion, including identifying missed opportunities for immunization. And our fourth aim was to establish an HPV immunization data set or data repository to be used for future clinical care of patients with HPV-related outcomes. Our IRB-approved design was a retrospective chart review with cross-reference to state immunization registry data, if available. Our project aligned with two of children's strategic goals at the time, those being to deliver safe, exceptional, and affordable care for every child, and to help children treated at Cincinnati Children's to be the healthiest in the nation. And we anticipate that our work will further uh, develop the Cancer Institute's national expertise and leadership in cancer prevention. However, we encountered some challenges. The first was related to the state immunization registries. What we found was that there is essentially to our knowledge, no mandate for our primary care provider colleagues to log immunizations. So when children are provided with a vaccine from the Vaccines for Children's Federal Program, it's expected that that immunization is logged in the state immunization registry for uh, future tracking. However, we have found that there essentially isn't a mandate to do that. And we found that by um, patients reporting to us that they had received the HPV vaccination. And when we went to look them up in the um, registry, 
in fact, there was no HPV related data in the registry. But when we went back to look at uh, the pediatrician's immunization record, the vaccines were in fact on the pediatrician's record, which uh, provided some discordant information um, indicating to us that although it's our colleagues do try to log the immunization, it, there is not currently a fail safe um, methodology in place to do this. There's also no cross communication between electronic medical records. For example, Cincinnati Children's will provide periodic updates to state registries, but we do not allow immunization registry data to be dumped back into our system. In terms of our project, that meant that we manually had to look up subjects individually in Ohio and Kentucky in the immunization registries. Unfortunately, I don't have results to uh, share with you at this particular time. I received in my in-basket just a day ago our preliminary analysis for over 1,880 survivors of pediatric cancer. I, I am not, because I'm on vacation, I have not been able to go through the data to present any of that to you, but I'll be happy to come back at a future time to present this, uh, these exciting results to you. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at deborah.kent at cchmc.org. Thank you very much for your attention to my presentation and hope that you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kent. We certainly do appreciate your time with us this morning and the presentation that you've prepared. So we appreciate you. Our next speaker comes to us from the National HPV Roundtable. We'd like to welcome Jennifer Sienko. Jennifer Sienko, MPH, is the director of the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable. Uh, Dr. Ms. Sienko's work focuses on HPV vaccination, communication, and public engagement through social media. I'm going to stop there for just one second, and then I'll come right back to your introduction. But we do have another poll for our participants this morning. We'd like to ask you to take just a moment to fill this out and let us know what sector do you represent. So I will come back to Jen's introduction. Forgive me, Jen. And I will ask participants to please fill out this poll while I do that. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, Jen Sienko, let's go back to you. Um, Ms. Sienko leads the HPV Roundtable work on HPV vaccine communication and public engagement, and she manages the digital footprint of the HPV Roundtable. Ms. Sienko is interested in using online media to help reinforce the social norm of vaccination, especially in the context of HPV vaccines. Prior to her work with the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable, Ms. Sienko was the Special Assistant to the President's Cancer Panel, where she helped research, write, and publish several reports, including Accelerating HPV Vaccine Uptake, Urgency for Action to Prevent Cancer. Ms. Sienko received her MPH from the George Washington University and is the co-founder of the nonprofit organization, Vaccines and Me. So Jen, we thank you so much for being with us. We are so grateful that you're spending your morning and I turn it over to you. Thank you. So I believe I have control. Yes. Um, so thank you for having me here today and for making me an honorary PhD. I, I always appreciate that. Um, I'm here uh, representing the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable to give you a few tips and tools for maintaining and improving HPV vaccination rates. Uh, maybe I don't have control. Ah. So why focus on HPV? Well, we have heard um, from previous presenters uh, several good reasons. One, we have a vaccine that can prevent cancers and not just one cancer and not in just one um, gender, but uh, excuse me, uh, sex. So it's it's six cancers that affect both men and women. We know that HPV vaccine lags behind other routinely given adolescent vaccines such as Tdap and um, meningococcal. And we know that we can do better. So uh, we heard, um, I believe it was from Alexa Casket earlier on the implications of the COVID pandemic. And I'm not sure I don't need to tell anyone on this call, um, what life has looked like in, in, our, in our clinical settings for the last year plus, but we know that there have been canceled and delayed well child visits, um, 
we've had to implement new clinic safety protocols. Uh, we were told to stay at home. <laughs> um, for, so we knew we were safer at home. Uh, so routine care was uh, often delayed. And uh, those sort of behavioral nudges that we get from school mandates or, um, excuse me, school injury requirements or workplace requirements around vaccination were not there. Not sure. Okay. <laughs> so um, really the, the bottom line is as of May of this year, um, we were down over 11 million doses of vaccine in the public sector alone when compared to 2019. Uh, and while we are down across the lifespan in terms of vaccination, the gap is largest primarily in these vaccines given to adolescents. So Tdap um, and uh, all three of them are in the double digits in terms of percentages down, but HPV down is down the most with 19.3% um, deficit in the public sector alone. And we know that the private sector um, is also experiencing deficits. So for those of you who like to skip to the last page of a book, here's sort of the screen grab um, of what we can do. And uh, I'll be giving you some resources that sort of speak to all of these three things. But the good news is, is we know what we need to do and we can do it. And it's very similar to what we were doing before COVID to increase HPV vaccination rates. So there are interventions that focus on the patient or the parent, such as client reminders and patient education materials, exam room posters, waiting room posters, um, outreach uh, through community events. There are interventions that focus on the clinic, the provider or the clinical staff specifically. So these are um, provider assessment and feedback. So getting to know your data, uh, comparing your clinic, city, state to larger national trends to see how you stack up. Professional education, like today's webinar, standing orders, which allow um, vaccinations to be given uh, more easily within a clinic. And then there are interventions that we know work around increasing access. And this, I think, is the area that COVID has really maybe um, expanded our creative thinking. And so, uh, before COVID, we talked about reducing barriers in terms of payment, you know, so making sure that uh, people knew about vaccines for children uh, program or that vaccines were covered by insurance. But now uh, we are more used to thinking about access in terms of creative clinical spaces. So drive through vaccination clinics, modified hours of service, um, you know, even in some cases, separate locations for sick visits and well visits. So tip number one, um, it, it starts with you <laughs> to make an effective recommendation for cancer prevention. This is the number one thing that you can do to um, increase HPV vaccination rates in your clinic. So what makes it an effective recommendation? Well, it's strong, it's timely, it's bundled, and it's easy to use. So what does that look like? Well, um, if you're starting the conversation at age nine, uh, then you would say, today, Blake is due for their HPV vaccine. This is a vaccine that protects against six kinds of cancer later in life, and we'll give it at the end of the visit. So it's not a long paragraph of text. It's not a lot to remember. It's timely today. It's strong, protects against cancer. Um, and you are assuming or making a presumption that the parent will in fact vaccinate. So um, it, it assumes that the answer to vaccination is yes. If you are giving the HPV vaccine as a part of a bundled recommendation when Tdap and Menin are given, then um, the language is very similar. Today, Blake is due for their routine Tdap, HPV and meningococcal vaccines we will give those vaccines at the end of the visit. Again, very brief, simple, and it doesn't in 
um, inspire questions. So if a parent has questions about a vaccine, obviously uh, you would want to effectively respond to those questions. And there are several resources on um, how best to respond to parental questions or hesitancy in the clinic. But to start from a place of uh, confidence, assuming that uh, parents want and will accept the vaccine, uh, tends to lead to increased HPV completion rates. Next slide. So tip number two, optimize your patient data. So you can't change what you can't know, and you can't know what you can't measure. So know your individual vaccination rate, either if you're in a multi, um, multi-provider clinic, you know, compare your rates to your colleagues' rates. If you are in a multi-clinic system, compare your clinic to other clinics in your system. Um, this is a, it, it's helpful because oftentimes we think we're doing better than we actually are. But once we get into the data, um, you can start to, to more effectively um, um, stratify your patient population. So, some things that have worked for other clinics during time of COVID when they were trying to maintain their HPV rates, they would make a list of patients who were up to date with their well child visits, but overdue for vaccines. So these are kids who had come in and seen a clinician or a provider, but for some reason didn't get um, their vaccines. So you can do this in a number of ways. You can use state registry data when that's available. You can use um, your EHR to run alert lists or reports. Um, and you can also uh, have your staff pull, pull a list of adolescents who have not been seen for a year. If you've ever worked with ACS and um, our interventions and implementations team, they're a huge proponent of quality improvement. Um, measures. And so if you are interested in running quality metric reports, uh, please reach out to your local ACS superhero and we can definitely help you do that. But running reports, um, you can filter by vaccination status, age, visit dates, and provider. And all of this is just going to help you be able to prioritize um, who to reach out to first to come back into the clinic to get caught up on vaccines. Uh, tip number three, parents need to know it's time to come back in. So, uh, so once you've identified uh, uh, patients within your uh, patient population who need to come back in, reach out to the parents to remind them that, hey, it's safe. We, um, we want to see you. We're, we're, we miss you <laughs> and your child is due for some important preventative health services. So you can reach out through your member portal, uh, email and text messages, phone calls, uh, postcards. There are lots of ways that you are probably are already reaching out to your patients. So um, you can utilize those same ways to, to reach out to them, to remind them or just to let them know that it's safe to come back in and that um, the CDC is recommending that people come back in for routine care. You can also um, communicate directly with your patients and parents when they're in the clinic, maybe for another reason, the importance of routine vaccinations and getting caught up. Um, unfortunately, last year with the safer at home measures, many schools, um, if not all, were virtual. And so uh, uh, back to school vaccinations were not prioritized. And back to school vaccine, vaccination season, those, those school interview requirements are a very powerful behavioral nudge to parents. It reminds them, oh yeah, I need to do this. So you're not, you're helping parents remember to do something that they probably already intended to do, but just sort of forgot in the shuffle of 2020. So um, often they'll just need to know that, oh yeah, Blake is due, come on in. We have these clinic hours and our clinic is safe. Um, we're taking these COVID protocols. Uh, and, and usually that's, that's enough to um, reassure a parent. We also have an opportunity now um, with catch up. 
uh, with COVID vaccines. So uh, the FDA approved Pfizer for uh, 12 to 15. And so if you have patients who did not start the HPV vaccine at nine um, or have started it, but have, are, have not completed it yet, if they come in for a COVID vaccine, it is okay to co-administer the HPV vaccine with the COVID vaccine. The CDC has updated its clinical guidance on that. Um, and I would recommend if you uh, do administer vaccines that you check out their guidance. AAP, um, American Academy of Pediatrics also has updated their, their guidance. And so um, there are resources out there if you are looking for technical answers to co-administration. Um, so I might have missed a, a slide here, but that's okay. So this is tip four. Um, it's enhanced access to immunization services. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so enhanced access to immunization services. So what does this look like? Uh, it looks like um, options, uh, creative thinking and options around scheduling visit types and or location. So you can, we've seen clinics extend their hours to include evenings and weekends to make it easier for working parents to bring in kids for um, routine care, either after work or when, um, at, during the weekends when there's no virtual schooling and, and hopefully no work. Um, uh, we've seen other clinics schedule well child visits in the morning and sick visits in the afternoon to help reassure parents that it's safe to bring in their healthy kids for routine care because um, sick patients won't be waiting uh, or, you know, no one's in waiting rooms anymore, but um, won't also be utilizing the clinic at the same time. We've seen a lot of clinics flex in terms of uh, their visitation types. So some clinics have, you know, these, they still are offering walk-in visits. Um, others have nurse only visits or, um, you know, you, visits where you do meet with your primary care provider, but being able to stratify based on, um, you know, you, you're not going to need uh, a full hour at the clinic for a routine vaccination uh, uh, appointment. And then this got a lot of attention in the news, um, a novel location. So we have heard about drive through COVID vaccination sites, um, but also we've seen clinics and systems stratify sort of where they give uh, well child visits and immunization catch up. Maybe they have a specific building or uh, if it's a multi-clinic system, they'll say well child visits go to clinic A and everything else goes to clinic B. Um, and then we've also really seen the utilization of telemedicine as a tool so that you can do the, um, the consultation by telemedicine and then have the parent come in with the child just for the vaccine, um, uh, you know, a shorter vaccine visit uh, after the fact. All right, so it takes a village and it takes a clinic. And we know that it's important that the entire office be on board with a um, accurate and evidence-based immunization message. So we know that um, educating all office staff on the importance of vaccination is a very important tip for maintaining and increasing um, all vaccination rates. So what does this look like? Well, you can include all of your office staff, including reception in training programs to get them on the same page as, um, as you know, your nurse practitioners and your, and your, your MDs and your PAs and all of the alphabet soups in the office. Um, we have seen a clinic in Seattle that's created a cue card specific to HPV vaccination and they put it, it's just a little index card that's printed and they put it by the phones or on the computer at reception so that when the front um, office staff are calling, parents to schedule uh, HPV immunization. If they have questions, they have a really easy sort of um, approved you know, answer sheet in front of them. They don't have to uh, 
go off the top of their head. And that's been very uh, successful for them. Uh, you can invite an HPV cancer survivor to talk to your staff or show a video. There are um, lots of wonderful, excellent survivor videos if it's uh, not possible to get someone to come in. But also the power of a, a survivor story is just unmatched when it comes to really telling people the um, severity of HPV disease and pushing the importance of prevention. And as I mentioned before, there are trainings uh, for providers and office staff on how to clearly respond to parental questions. But hey, for my reading rainbow people, I might be dating myself here. Um, you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, we're not the HPV roundtable. It's not the only ones who are saying that these are um, ways to maintain or increase your vaccination rates. The National Foundation of Infectious Disease has um, this handout. It's five key steps to improve HPV vaccination rates. And again, we have this consistent staff messaging, sharing the benefit with parents, bundling, making an effective HPV recommendation, and um, routinizing procedures to reduce missed opportunities. So that looks like, you know, uh, EHR prompts when a patient comes in, um, automated recall reminders, and also scheduling a second dose appointment in the clinic before that um, patient leaves. We also have it, oh, we also have it from on high. This is Melinda Wharton from the CDC giving the featured presentation at uh, the National HPV Vaccination Roundtables meeting, a uh, national meeting which happened two weeks ago. And ag again, she's saying, we know what needs to be done. We just need to do it. And you'll see, identify families that need to come in, prompt clinicians to, to give strong recommendations when vaccines are due. Let families know what precautions are in place to keep them safe from COVID. And then um, if, if you're a part of an organization or a health plan or a health system, there are some, you can implement these tips sort of systemically on an enterprise-wide level um, as well. You may have also heard of a little organization called the American Cancer Society. They also uh, recommend to uh, employ these evidence-based strategies to increase uh, HPV vaccination rates. But again, I do wanna stress that um, we're down all, all vaccination rates. So I'm obviously here representing the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable, but um, these tips and tools are equally effective for calling in patients for MMR, uh, flu, you know, other, other critical um, vaccines that we know uh, were not given last year. So I also promised you some tools that you can use. And this is an oldie, but a goodie. So if you're not familiar with the steps guide from the American Cancer Society, this is um, a wonderful seven page document that really lays out how your clinic can implement some evidence-based strategies to increase your HPV vaccination rates. This is available through ACS. And if you are interested in uh, doing a QI project, um, again, reach out to your local ACS superhero. Uh, the Roundtable published late last year a promising practices uh, document of clinics around the nation, things that they had done during COVID to maintain or increase their vaccination rates. Um, so uh, you can see this is available on the hpvroundtable.org website and the URL is at the bottom of the page. Uh, but this does include clinic examples and um, references. The Roundtable also has uh, action guides for um, individual types. So we have an action guide for uh, physicians, physician assistants, and nurse practitioners. We have one for nurses and medical assistants. We have one for dental. I'm not sure if we have any dental providers here today, but um, our dentists, we love partnering with our dental provider colleagues 
uh, around especially education since they do tend to see this patient population um, pretty consistently. And then we also do have resources for office staff and administrative staff. So if that is something you're interested in, I would highly encourage you to take a look at these um, action guides. We also have a very specific uh, toolkit for nurses at all clinical levels called Nurses Get It Done. Uh, this is a toolkit that contains some HPV 101 for um, you know, people who are maybe looking for a little more information around how the vaccine was made or the ingredients, and then also includes a section on responding to parental questions or hesitancy. Um, this, again, is available on our website and does have a bunch of different social media assets and um, a certificate of completion and a training webinar. So it's a whole package. would highly encourage you to check that out. We also have a, an entire page on our website dedicated to uh, getting back on track. Um, I can't, you know, the limitations of a screen grab, but on this page, if you were to scroll down, we link out to um, several organizations uh, to their guidance documents. And so we have it organized. Um, you can search either by organization or by audience type. So if you're looking specifically for um, uh, guidance around COVID, um, COVID administration and COVID vaccine co-administration, you could either search by the CDC or AAP, or you could search by um, clinician or provider. And you don't have to start from scratch. So we have created uh, a list of social shareables uh, specific to getting back on track. These are in the process of being updated. They were created before the emergency use authorization uh, for 12 to uh, 15 year olds for COVID vaccine. And at the time we thought that you, we would not be able to co-administer COVID vaccine with any other vaccines. And we now know that um, we are able to co-administer. So there might be some uh, language on, I think just one of these that says, get it before, get the HPV vaccine before COVID because of this co-administration issue. But um, for the most part, these are, are good to go and um, really great for, they've been optimized for your clinic's social media platforms. And video, who doesn't love a good YouTube video? Well, the Roundtable created uh, their own YouTube channel. And so not only do we post our um, original content to this channel, we also link out to our members' channels and videos. So if you're looking for those survivor videos, we have a survivor video playlist. If you are looking for that Melinda Wharton talk from our national meeting, it is in, it's highlighted right now um, on our uh, homepage, on our channel homepage. And then we have lots of resources um, for, for everyone at the clinical level and also for parents. So I know that was quick. Um, I wanted to leave time for some questions, but uh, please stay connected with us. Uh, you can reach out to me directly. Uh, there's our website and we're on most social media platforms um, if you search HPV Roundtable. So that, that's all for me, Deb, thanks. Deb, thank you so much. Fantastic update, fantastic tools and resources. Um, I know that all of you can see that we've put in the chat the link to the HPV Roundtable for all of those resources. Many of the questions that we've seen come through the Q&A are, are just about resources. So I think you've probably taken care of most of those. The only other question I see is, is the Seattle Clinic willing to share their cue cards for front desk staff to use? They are. And in fact, um, they are already working with ACS to... Um, to edit those so that they can be used nationally and they will be available um, with the ACS brand. So um, stay tuned, but yes, uh, they will be shared. Perfect, perfect, Jen, thank you. Thank you so much. We're grateful for your participation and your conversation with us this morning. Incredibly helpful, Jen, thanks. 
Next up, we have some information that we'd like to share with you about one of the programs happening with the American Cancer Society right now. The program is called Gold Together. We have Gold Together volunteers who wanted to share their message about this important initiative with you today. Hi, my name is Sarah Morris. On February 12th, 2008, I was 17 and heard the words, you have cancer, being diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. That is why I am passionate about the American Cancer Society's Gold Together campaign and have chosen to be a candidate to raise funds for this very important cause. My name is Liz Varga and I am passionate about the area of pediatric cancer research, both personally and professionally. I work at Nationwide Children's where we fight every day to understand the genetic underpinnings of pediatric cancer and develop targeted therapies. I also have a personal connection to this disease as my cousin Julie Jones was diagnosed at a young age with a pediatric brain tumor and more recently my niece Isabella was diagnosed with retinoblastoma. I support the ACS because they help fund research that's so important to breakthroughs, as well as provide necessary education and support. Hello, my name is Kristen Brown and I am passionate about supporting the American Cancer Society's Gold Together campaign. In 2021, approximately 2,000 children under the age of 15 are expected to die from cancer. As a survivor of a rare congenital brain tumor, I am asking you to help me and the American Cancer Society Gold Together campaign this September. All funds raised through Gold Together support programs of childhood cancer, research, support services and awareness, as well as cancer prevention efforts targeting children. By working together, we will have more of an impact, more options for care, and better outcomes. You can support me. I hope to see you this fall. I support ACS's Gold Together campaign in the month of September because I am determined to help find a cure for all pediatric cancers so that no parent has to hear that their child will die of cancer. I do this in memory of my nephew, Asher who was a victim of ependymoma, a pediatric brain cancer. Asher succumbed to the disease in 2013 at the age of just four. After fighting through chemo, radiation, and multiple surgeries for over a year and a half of his short life. I loved Asher. He had a kind heart and a beautiful soul, and I will always miss him. And so I continued to fight on for him and for all children to find a cure. ACS's Gold Together campaign is an important component of that fight. And so I hope you'll join me in supporting this campaign. Thank you so much for sharing that important message. We appreciate it. We also welcome the Ohio chapter of the American Academy of, American Academy of Pediatrics. They're going to share some information on two exciting initiatives that they're leading. Good morning. This is Lori Sharon Winland with the Ohio Chapter American Academy of Pediatrics. I want to thank ACS for this opportunity to discuss two programs with you today. The first is our upcoming HPV Quality Improvement Project, and the second is our Grassroots Advocacy Coalition, Ohio Champions for Vaccines, or OC for V. Ohio AAP is excited to announce that we will soon be enrolling practices for a new quality improvement project focused on HPV. Starting later this summer, this QI project will allow you to learn from experts on how to increase your practice's HPV immunization rates through strong provider recommendations and addressing parental vaccine hesitation. CME and MOC credits will be available for participating practices. Please contact me for more information or to enroll. Ohio AAP is also excited to announce the relaunching of our Immunization Coalition, Ohio Champions for Vaccines. Let me take a couple of minutes to walk through how oc for v came to be.
we want to say thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for spending your morning with us. We want to thank you to our speakers and thank you to our meeting planners today for an excellent job and a great forum. With just a few parting thoughts, you'll be receiving an electronic evaluation following this program. Your completion of the evaluation will provide us valuable feedback on this program and help us as we design and implement similar offerings. Your valued feedback enables us to continue to offer free CMEs. You'll also receive a follow-up survey in approximately six months, giving you an opportunity to share the important updates and progress on your work to reignite HPV vaccination. We wanna give one last thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to Cincinnati Children's Medical Center, thank you to Dayton Children's Hospital, and thank you to The Ohio State University. Thank you to Lori Sharon Winland from the Ohio AAP for her support in securing CME credit for this event. We also want to thank the Ohio Partners for Cancer Control for their continued support. Lastly, this program has been approved for two CME online only live AAFP prescribed credits. You will receive CME certification following the program in the mail. In closing, we hope that you can join us for our upcoming virtual events. Keep these dates in mind. On August 26th, we'll bring you a forum on breast cancer in light of the pandemic and screening. In November 4th, we'll bring you an update on lung cancer screening again in light of the pandemic. Thank you so much for taking your time to be with us this morning. Thank you for joining the conversation. We appreciate your efforts in preventing cancer by vaccinating young people against HPV. On behalf of the American Cancer Society, our sponsors of today's program, and the next generation of leaders across Ohio and West Virginia, we thank you and wish you a good day.